Hi. Welcome everybody to our panel, Lakeland's Legacy, Public Humanities and Restorative Justice with Courtney Thurston, MA student, African American Studies at Morgan State University, Violetta Sharp Jones, Vice Chair of Lakeland Community Heritage Project, Trevor Munoz, Director, Maryland Institute for Technology in the Humanities at University of Maryland College Park, and Maxine Gross, Chair of Lakeland Community Heritage Project. And I'm glad we have such a diverse group in terms of where everybody is coming from. That's great to know. Um, so they're going to share with us today the uh, Lakeland Digital Archives and stories of the African American Lakeland community in Prince George's County. I just shortened your thing. They could read the rest. <laughs> uh, you all go right ahead. Okay, if you're talking, we're not, he we're not hearing anything yet. Hello, I'm Violetta Sharps Jones, a member of Lakeland Community Heritage Pro Project, and I am a fifth generation Lakelander. I also am a local historian and genealogist, and I'm happy to be here today. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about this wonderful community of Lakeland that was established in 1890, and I kind of start with my family's journey to Lakeland. Um, this picture here is a picture of my great grandparents, Nanny Walls Johnson and James Johnson, who bought their family of six children to Lakeland from Westmoreland County, Virginia, sometime between 1890 and 1900. The first census records that we find them on is the 1900 census record. Uh, along with Nanny and her family was also her sister. And by 1910, there were four other members of Nanny Walls Johnson's family residing in Lakeland. So obviously their journey that brought them to Lakeland made them stay there and they wanted to grow their families and make Lakeland their home. Um, Lakeland is a community that thrived on its family connections. I would say that that is the strongest part of the history of Lakeland and the part that's greatly lost in the additional things that happened to the Lakeland community through urban renewal. The bottom photo is actually a photo of my mom and dad. Um, I'm the baby on the lap and my sister and we resided in the family home that had been in the family since it was purchased by Nanny and James in 1907. Uh, the other picture is a picture to show the strong family connections. You have the matriarch of that family, um, Harriet Hughes, who also was a midwife. So she serviced a lot of people, brought a lot of lives into the Lakeland community being a nurse. And those are generations of her family. Um, even though members of the family would move away, they always were rooted in Lakeland. They came back to visit the family through the churches, schools, or just their family connections. Next picture. We're very thankful to Edwin Newman because it was his vision um, that found the, the land and bought the land that created Lakeland and his goal was to develop it as a exclusive resort community for his friends and connections in the Washington DC area. And advertised heavily in the newspapers and other means to get people to come to Lakeland to see the beauty of Lakeland and to build their homes, develop their homes, buy their homes. Um, everything was centered around the lakes um, there were at one point five lakes and they had different purposes, whether it was for leisure, for um, breeding 
um, breeding fish, the aquarium fisheries, um, breeding um, bass, excuse me, for the purposes of um, the agricultural college. Uh, it was a, a vision of his and it started um, on a grand scale. Um, however, some there was a turn in the economics between 1893 and 1900 that drastically changed the community. Um, the Blacks came and they were supporting the families that came there in, in the means of taking care of their families, doing um, service duties in their homes, and also, um, you know, farming and doing things like that. But when the turn in the economic development of Lakeland came, the Black families that were there were able to take advantage of it. And that's when they started purchasing their homes that often had been abandoned by the previous owners. So that's how the story began and how Lakeland began to thrive. Next page. And these are just some prominent um, family names that were in Lakeland in the beginning. And they, to this day, have um, associations with the Lakeland community. There were Brooks family, the Hicks family, um, Annie Hicks and Benjamin Hicks were some of the earliest home, home homeowners in the central part of Lakeland, beginning as early as 1903. And the community continued to grow. Next page. Early, uh, once the Lakelanders came, um, they were very thankful and appreciative. So they immediately started giving thanks and they knew that worship was important to them. Um, they began worshiping in family homes. And from that, they were able to grow and expand and build their churches. The two prominent churches were First Baptist um, and Embry AME, and both of those churches remain in the community today. Um, socially, the churches were what we turned to um, early, uh, whether you were a member of the junior choir, the Sunday school or whatever, we welcomed going to church and participating in those activities. And we participated in activities, even if we, it was something going on at the Baptist church. If you were a Methodist person, you also went to that program too. So it was something that we did, did and we enjoyed together. And those two churches have grown quite a bit and they will always be part of the Lakeland community. Next page. Early also, along with um, religion and giving thanks, we recognized that we needed to be educated, that that was truly the key. And for many of those first Lakelanders that came that was missing in their heritage is not having an education. Our first um, school was in 1904 and it was a one room schoolhouse that John C. Johnson went to um, Edwin Newman and his wife and asked for land to be set aside so that they could build that one room schoolhouse. So from that one room schoolhouse, we then advanced to be part of the Rosenwald school system. And Lakeland was blessed to have two Rosenwald schools, one that serviced the children from first grade to uh, sixth grade, and then the high school that opened in 1928, um, serviced uh, high school students. And it serviced a community of African Americans that lived in the what we call the Route One corridor. So from the D Washington D.C. line as far north as Laurel and Savage, Maryland, and then even over uh, inward to parts of Bowie, Mitchellville, all of the black students from at the, that time period, 1928 to 1950, came into Lakeland to go to high school. So Lakeland was not only uh, an important part of the Lakelanders' lives, it also was a very vital part of the other communities. Next page. Um, Lakelanders sought jobs wherever they could and 
part of the attraction to come into Lakeland was the fact that, you know, with all the building and construction of homes and a uh, new community developing, there would be work, whether it was farming, whether it was housekeeping. Um, we also looked at the university that was developing. So um, then it was the University College, Agriculture College. Um, we also looked at the, the airport. Lakelanders were uh, employed at the College Park Air, Airport um, from the early 1900s until maybe about 1930 and beyond. But we do have documentation of several of the, the Black um, Lakelanders that worked as um, mechanic helpers, uh, mail carriers, and um, I guess in the uh, landscaping of the airport. Also, the unit, as I say, the University of Maryland, we have some documentation of the Dory family that has dated back to like 1893. And it was just a tradition that the family members would continue working at the University of Maryland. Next slide. Lakelanders also were very proud. We also participated in military services, World War I, World War II, and beyond. This is a collection of several Lakelanders that participated. Um, my dad, um, Joseph Johnson, and Mr. Braxton um, were all proud of their military service. Next slide. Um, socially, Lakeland was very involved. We had um, social organizations. Um, you have pictures here of um, the Duchess. That's a female organization. Not quite sure what their main purpose was, but they always looked like they were having a good time. They dressed well and they had annual events. Um, also, their counterpart was the Duchess, and every photo that I see of them, they are dressed in their tails and just looking great. <laughs> um, I also want people to know that Lakelanders participate in a lot of social things from fraternal organizations. Um, our children were debutantes. Um, our children took piano lessons. We went to participate in dance recitals, just the whole gambit of things that we did socially. One of the things that we enjoyed earlier was we went to Cars and Sparrows Beach, which were two beaches in the Annapolis, Maryland area that were owned by a black family. And those beaches we were very appreciative of because they were they were the only beaches that we could go to for a time. Um, various entertainers came there, but mainly it was just a great venue for uh, for Lakelanders and all of the Route 1 corridor and other Black communities gathered at the beach during the summer, either through annual trips from their churches, from their recreation centers, or just in general, you would have a, a, a beach outing. We also played a lot of sports in Lakeland, especially baseball. Um, so very early, um, we developed various baseball teams. There was a time when um, on the weekend, the community would be just full of buses that would come in to see the baseball game, the Sandlot baseball um, that Lakeland participated in. Um, we had our own diamond and communities came from as far as Calvert County, St. Mary's County. They all came in and competitively competed in, the, in baseball as a sport. Next picture. And now we're going to go to Courtney. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Ms. Bly. And thank you, everyone, for lending an hour and an ear to hear Lakeland's story. I'm really honored to be here as well. Like many cities in the early 1960s, College Park began to launch an urban renewal project in an attempt to address inadequate housing conditions, largely caused by governmental neglect and segregation. Initiated by federal legislation passed in the late 1950s, these local projects were intended to address blight in cities and suburbs. However, their implementation often resulted in the destruction of homes and displacement of many, mainly African-American residents. Today, I'll be sharing Lakeland's urban renewal story. Next slide, please. 
College Parks Urban Renewal Authority was officially established in August of 1967. When the urban renewal plan was finalized in 1969, the project planned to upgrade 150 or sorry, 105 acres where 137 families live in an attempt to rehabilitate the areas. Dozens of signs like the one seen here were posted to warn residents of urban renewal clearance areas. Next slide, please. In 1970, the Washington Post Times Herald reported that the project would provide high rise apartments with 300 units and 60 to 90 townhouses and re rehabilitate more than 70 existing houses while raising about 40 others and providing a maximum of 41 units for low income families. The map on the right hand side is a visual representation of the neighborhood as it existed around 1970 as the urban renewal project got underway. Although visualizations like this of the neighborhood during the era of segregation are scarce, the urban renewal project inspired a proliferation of documentation. These artifacts reflect the governmental neglect the neighborhood experienced in segregation and the hyper-focused attention it received as a developmental project once urban renewal was initiated. Next slide, please. However, by 1973, administration and funding changes, as well as damage done by Hurricane Agnes in 1972, disrupted the project timeline and budget. Oral histories remember Hurricane Agnes as the worst flooding in the neighborhood's history, causing damage to multiple homes, mainly in the east and central areas of the neighborhood. You can see from this picture here. Next slide, please. In 1973, Lakeland Derby Lomax was elected mayor of College Park. He was the second African American and Lakelander to serve on the College Park City Council between 1957 and 1973. And he was the first and only African American African American mayor in College Park's history. Mayor Lomax was meant to symbolize a change in city governance. However, as demolitions and displacement began in 1974, some residents felt betrayed. By 1980, Lomax was quoted saying, good, bad, or indifferent, people will always look on urban renewal as being my baby, even though I didn't nurse the baby. It just seemed as though there was one bureaucratic trap after another. Next slide, please. By the end of urban renewal in the late 1980s, over 100 homes had been demolished, displacing many multi-generational families and transforming the landscape of the neighborhood. This map is actually two maps overlaid. The base map, a faint outline, showed the original plat map of, Ed, Ed, oh, sorry, of Edwin Newman that we saw earlier. And the second map shows the blacked out sites of substandard housing and shaded blighted uses that developers saw when they looked at Lakeland. And from this, we see how much of Lakeland's original area became inhabited and how much blight city officials and developers saw in Lakeland. Next slide, please. Today, only a small fraction of what Lakeland once was remains. After completion of the urban renewal plan, residential land ownership has significantly decreased, and the majority of ownership went to private partners like Leon Wiener and Associates or Maryland Park and Planning. Lakeland's story emphasizes the importance of Black placemaking, and the inclusion of their voices in public histories of the landscape gives us a fuller perspective on African Americans' quest for citizenship. The neighborhood's intersections in public humanities inspire various projects, which I'll let Ms. Maxine Gross take from here to tell us about and how Lakeland's legacy has continued. Thank you, Courtney. And thank you for allowing me to speak before you this afternoon. My Maxine Gross and I'm chair of the Lakeland Community Heritage Project. I'm gonna pick up a bit of the story a number of years after where Courtney left off. In 2002, a group of Lakelanders were met during a civic association meeting and, and we fell, fell into conversation and started talking about how the community that we knew was nearly gone, that two thirds of the community had, had been destroyed due to urban renewal and that the remaining area was inhabited by people that primarily didn't know 
about Lakeland's rich history. Um, we were people who had grown up in Lakeland and wanted the, the story of our four parents to continue, even if they had lost their land, that their memories were important and that without those memories, it would be as though the community and the people never existed. What we did was we started um, to, to talk about Lakeland and to document the story of the community. That was in 2002. We had our first Lakeland Heritage event. Um, the whole movement, as it were, kind of stewed for a while. And in 2006, we had our first big um, collections event. And that came about because uh, some friends, um, folks who had come to that initial event in 2002, uh, came to us and said, uh, we know some people who have, have experience in preservation and they have this concept called a digital archive. And um, a gentleman by the name of Edvard Thorson um, came to us and talked about what he was doing with another community and loaned us some equipment and, and started to uh, give us training on how to use it. And we started collecting images and reports and other materials from Lakelanders um, to hold the Lakeland story. Uh, for a number of years, though, that material lived on hard drives in people's closets and uh, storerooms. And in 2009, we put that material together to publish a book called um, Lakeland African Americans in College Park. It's available today on in print uh, at Arcadia Press through Amazon or you know any bookseller. In 2018, uh, we were still doing uh, annual events and um, preservation activities, collections events, but we started to partner with the Maryland Institute for Technology in the Humanities, who you'll hear from Trevor, the director, in a few minutes, um, to to formalize the archival material that we had started collecting and to make it available publicly. Uh, in 2020, I will tell you a little bit more, but the city of College Park apologized for its uh, action uh, in urban renewal and promised restorative justice. Those are some of the key points of uh, what's been going on in Lakeland. And let me uh, give you a little bit more meat on those uh, bare bones. Next slide, please. This is a copy of uh, Lakeland African-Americans in College Park. If you're interested in getting a copy, you can uh, use the code there and uh, purchase one on Amazon. Next slide. Um, one thing about that book is that it has proven to be an invaluable tool in helping us to carry on the story of Lakeland. You know, as we do collections events, as we talk to people about Lakeland, we usually have only an hour or a few minutes to kind of tell a whole story, but we can always point to that book as a resource for people to learn more. Um, one of those times that we've talked about the, the Lakeland story, uh, we came in contact with some young uh, mus musicians who were inspired to use the Lakeland story to produce a, uh, a musical composition called Shadows of Lakeland. You can use uh, this code here to look at it on YouTube or uh, other recorded means. It uses material from our digital archive to um, inspire and to punctuate uh, the story of Lakeland told in 
utilizing precaution. I, I really can't describe it to you, uh, but I would really encourage you to go in and take a look at it. It tells the story in ways that words really can. Next slide. Another way that we've used the material from the digital archive is to help remind the city of College Park about their promise for restorative justice. Um, that promise was made in 2020. Uh, the whole concept took a lot of time to actually take root and to actually bear any fruit at all. Um, I will tell you that only a couple of days ago, the city uh, named the members of a restorative justice commission that will be working on the whole concept of restorative justice for Lakeland. Let me uh, take a couple of minutes with you to look at the video. Um, it's something that was produced along with our partners with MIF. I don't believe the audio is working. When you share your screen, um, you have to click the little audio button at the top that'll allow you. So when you press share, look up, sorry, it's another, <laughs> another platform thing to learn. Uh, do you see that little drop down where there's a little speaker? You, and if you, if you press that, you should be able to hear sound. Optimize for sound, I think it is, yeah. Sorry, it had to reinstall audio drivers, so I'm back and I'll uh, start the video. Okay. <laughs> well, while that's working, um, one thing that I will say about having those images um, and other materials in the um, in the digital archive, they have proved as an uh, val invaluable resource in us sharing the Lakeland story. Um, we've used them for lectures like this. We've used them for um, this video. We've used them to help inspire murals and um, other pieces of art. It's just a way to tell the Lakeland story in media and just it has more impact than simply explaining something to someone. Driving along US-1, you see new high-rise developments along strip shopping centers and fast food shops. Just take a turn onto Lakeland Road near the University of Maryland's North Gate, and you will find Lakeland. Maybe it would be truer to say the remains of Lakeland, the historic African-American community of College Park. Lakeland grew as a community during the time of segregation, 1865 to about 1970. Schools and houses were not desegregated in Prince George's County until very late. Then there was white flight, but those stories are for another day. Lakeland was a vibrant place with boundaries that reached from just behind the east side of US-1 across the BNO railroad tracks to include what is now Lake Artemisia Natural Area. It was a place of extended families where nearly everyone was related. These ties made it natural for people to work together to meet all types of needs, including care of the old and the young. There were homes, some large and others more modest, 
with huge vegetable gardens, schools, churches, a social hall, lodge building, stores, beauty shops, and baseball fields. Lakeland was a place where people lived, loved, and celebrated. So, what happened? Urban renewal happened. In the 1960s, Lakelanders, like many other Black residents across the nation, worked to exercise community control over their neighborhoods in resistance to housing discrimination. Following the passage of federal legislation with the promise of addressing housing inequalities, residents petitioned the city of College Park for help. The community organized in hopes of protecting some of their homes from frequent flooding, alleviating the impacts of flooding in the area and helping some improve their homes. In 1969, residents, city and county officials, and stakeholders compromised on a redevelopment plan and officially made Lakeland a designated site for urban renewal. Although the federal policies were intended to improve lives of disenfranchised residents, the stories of Lakelanders who lived through this period reflect the destruction and transformation of Lakeland's landscape and community. Many family homes had been built in what government experts said were flood-prone areas. Many others were judged to be blight. In the end, 104 of Lakeland's 150 households were marked for demolition. By the end of the 1970s, most of Lakeland's residents were forced to leave and two-thirds of the land was cleared. Gone is the western part of Lakeland with its homes, the American Legion Post, social hall, and stores. After standing vacant for years, it was all replaced. Gone is the eastern part of Lakeland, its historic Rosenwald School building, and homes with their gardens. Gone are so many Lakeland families. Was there harm to Lakelanders? What does restorative justice mean for this community? Today, we Lakelanders are calling upon our city leaders to make good on their promise to aggressively seek opportunities for restorative justice. We must come together as a government and community and allow Lakelanders to speak out about the wrong done, the harm it caused, and set roads to restoration. Our vision is a building block for a Lakeland which is strong, healthy, safe, and inclusive. Although a great deal has been lost, Lakeland's story reflects the larger story of the African-American experience in Prince George's County, as well as the larger struggles for racial equality in our nation. While we should always be inspired by the resiliency of Lakeland's generations of residents, the neighborhood's history should cause us to question which histories are truly valued and why. Now that you've heard Lakeland's story, we hope to see you soon. Well, that brings my portion to an end. Um, next, Trevor will tell you more about the digital archive. Great. Thank you, Maxine. And thanks again to everyone who's joining us um, and listening to our story. Oops, don't want to play it. <laughs> Let's try. Okay, um, so yeah, I'll just offer a few more remarks here as we come toward the end of our time, uh, building on the story you've uh, heard already. Um, and uh, as Ms. Maxine mentioned, um, MYTH, uh, which is a research center that I lead um, at the University of Maryland College Park, joined this process in late 2017, or like 2017, 2018, um, to continue uh, helping Lakelanders tell their story in their own voices. Um, and I want to um, sort of emphasize the continuity of the digital archive part 
of this story with all the parts that we've heard before um, to emphasize that this latest stage of developing a digital archive, which I'll say a little bit more about and show in a moment, um, is part of a 20 year process. And I think that already makes it a really remarkable uh, uh, activity, um, both for seeing the types of work that humanities research can do in the world, right? Led by folks like Ms. Maxine and Ms. Vi and Ms. Courtney. Um, the political change, the sharing of stories, uh, all this work that the humanities are doing in the world. Um, and that uh, this is also a remarkable digital curation and digital preservation story. Uh, when we uh, were helping Lakelanders uh, sort of begin organizing the digital files that make up the archive and uh, begin adding to them, we were, you know, discovering files that were um, now almost 20 years old. Um, and there are a lot of cultural heritage organizations that would struggle um, to make similar claims for digital stewardship of materials in their care. So I want to emphasize the ways in which this is um, not a, a change from the work that Lakelanders have been doing before, but an expansion and a continuity with it. Um, so a few of the the thoughts that I wanted to share today. Sorry. Um, where again, this idea that the digital work isn't special. Uh, often, you know, when we begin to contemplate uh, digital humanities research or digital research, um, people uh, treat it as though it is completely different than what had come before, or that requires a special, uh, immensely valorized set of skills. Um, and I want to sort of emphasize continuity, but I also want to emphasize that the way that the L Lakeland Digital Archive is coming together um, has to be situated in the same sort of relationship-based process of co-creation, right? The way that Lakeland's heritage has been stewarded is based on the relationships of trust among the community members. When we um, had some listening sessions uh, with other Lakelanders and other members of the Maryland and Prince George's County communities, we heard so strongly the trust that folks had in LCHP as an organization that could steward this heritage and tell these stories. Um, and the work of building the digital um, is a way, has to be embedded in those same relationships of trust. And that that requires, um, as I think lots of people have probably said today when we're contemplating public humanities work, long-term participation and labor um, continuing to show up alongside um, people in the communities who are doing these work, this work and digital can't be different. Um, and I'll just offer that um, part of what MIT's role is here, the way that it aligns with our research mission is to recognize that our existing models of how digital collections are built and maintained don't actually fit well with community projects and public humanities work all the time. Um, if we imagine, you know, sort of two major models, right, a, a model of procurement, right, I have stuff and I need to go out and acquire a system in which I can put my stuff and I'll learn how to do whatever that system requires, whether that's sort of installing a particular digital platform or buying the services of a consultancy or whatever, um, that being one model, or even a model uh, where we're developing new tools or new software, but if we're still doing that work within a kind of um, capitalist um, and sort of Silicon Valley model, if you will, where our ideal is to sort of prototype, test, make efficient, and then transform into production a new digital system. Neither of those things actually accords well with the values and the needs of doing uh, community and public humanities work. So this is why we have to imagine something different. And part of the kind of background or additional work that Lakeland Digital Archive is doing um, is thinking about how do our ways of making digital collections need to keep changing and evolving to serve places like Lakeland. Um, and so just um, in closing, I wanna offer um, sort of three additional ideas that we might add to our repertoire as people thinking about doing digital projects alongside community members um, and in public. Um, and those are sort of these Three ideas. So the idea of being not allies, but accomplices, um, which is a, um, an idea that you hear a lot. I was 
made familiar with it by the indigenous action movement, um, right, to think about ways in which power dynamics, existing power dynamics can be overturned, resources can be reallocated, um, and justice can be served through the actions that we're doing. How can we push our digital archive development um, to be an action that accomplices take and not just an action of allyship, um, which is far less powerful. And then I also wanted to offer this idea of tinkering, um, particularly as an as an alternative way of thinking through that model of prototyping and production. Um, so scholars of disability uh, like Winance and of design like DeSalvo have talked about tinkering as um, a way of doing the work of exercising our imaginations together. Um, and that's very much the story of how the Lakeland Digital Archive continues to evolve. Um, and the distinction between something like tinkering and something like prototyping to production isn't in the value or completeness of what's produced. It's about how we think about the cycles of change that are necessary to get there. Um, so I love the story of, um, you know, well into the process of working on the Lakeland Digital Archive, having a conversation with Miss Maxine, and she was telling me about how she was working to improve the descriptions of some of the items in our collection, which are stored in an Airtable database. Um, by, um, you know, she had learned Airtable and was comfortable working with it, but many of the other community elders and folks who have the knowledge about what these materials are, are not equally comfortable with Airtable. So Miss Maxine would take a photograph from the Airtable database and, you know, send it to group chat um, and text with um, Lakeland elders to find out about who was in this photograph to identify people so that they're not anonymous in our collection and then enter that into the Airtable database. And so when I heard this story, I immediately realized that in the next version of the archive website that we needed to build, we needed to make it extremely easy so that if Maxine were to copy the URL for an individual item from our website and put it in group chat, that it would make it extremely easy then to go back and edit that specific record um, and update it quickly there, right? And adapting to the practices that we were inventing together of how to capture this history and heritage and display it as a digital archive. So that's just one example of many that I could list about the way in which working together um, as accomplices, we are reimagining the process of what it means to produce a digital archive. And that's something that certainly I, as someone who works in technology, could not do by myself. It has to be part of this uh, relationship-based process. Um, and along those lines, um, we have talked a lot recently about capacity building, right? How do we um, continue to empower Lakelanders to own and manage this material by training them on all these technological systems that we're developing together? Um, and that is an important capacity building challenge when you're thinking about doing community technology projects. But also when we're doing that to recognize the existing community strengths that that will be the that will that will be based upon, right? These networks of relationship and heritage that have been built over twenty years, um, that we are now adding the skills of working with a digital database or a website too, but which we are not by any means starting from a point of zero or a point of lack. We're building on an enormous community strength, um, and uh, really happy to be part of that process. Um, and so this uh, page will take you to the current preview of the of the Lakeland Digital Archive. What you'll see at that link is only about 5% of the collection. Uh, it's an exhibit of images from the book that Miss Maxine mentioned earlier. Um, and we're currently working on another big update to the site, which will greatly expand the amount of material that's available and visible online. Um, so we invite you to check it out come back, follow Lakeland uh, Community Heritage Project on the web, on, on Instagram, um, check back for updates. And we also wanna gratefully acknowledge some support from the National Endowment for the Humanities, a grant from the Office for, the Digital, for Digital Humanities helped fund um, part of this work. Um, so I think I'll close there. Um, and I really appreciate everyone's attention to our story of building uh, the Lakeland Digital Archive.
Okay, I'm trying to like nail down the last part of my notes, but um, I'm going to start with um, we have a question from uh, Isohe, uh for Ms. Gross. You talked about how a restorative justice committee was just formed. Who are the people on this committee and who are their co constituents? Are there folks from the historic community on the committee? All right, um, I didn't have time to really go into it, but there was initially a restorative justice steering committee that made a recommendation to the city uh, um, several months ago uh, about how to go forward with the restorative justice process. Um, the next step is the restorative justice commission and it, that was named about a week ago. Um, there are a little, a bit less than 20 people who were named. Some of the names I was not familiar with at all. I do know that a few of the Lakelanders here um, were people that were named. Uh, uh, so there are Lakelanders included, um, but also folks from the University of Maryland um, there's a, a rep, uh, the mayor of another, um, from one of the historic African American municipalities in the county. Um, I guess so. The answer to the question is yes, there are Lakelanders. Okay. So I want to ask another question that's along the same lines. Um, what does restorative justice for African American communities that have been destroyed by urban renewal look like? Your thoughts, your, your greatest imagination of what that might look like. Am I going to answer somebody? Else? <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll answer. Um, that's a really great question. And Ms. Vi has arrived just in time to be able to, to help us answer it. Um, that's part of the question that the Restorative Justice Steering Committee tried to answer. Um, basically, we said it, it has several parts. One part is to establish the history of exactly what happened. Another is to listen to Lakelanders, um, the, the people who it happened to uh, their descendants, to Lakelanders, which include not only the people who were alive during the time it happened, but also the descendants of those people, and find out what was the impact, what was the harm that was done. And lastly, would be to go about concrete measures of um, curing that harm to the extent that it's possible to do that. Okay, that's excellent. Um, so, uh, Ms. Gross, again, I guess we're picking on you a lot. Here. <laughs> um, you stated that memory is important. What do you envision as the greatest good that can come from the research and projects that highlight and tell the stories of the communities and their remaining descendants? I'll answer, but I think Courtney, and uh, that's what she's been studying for oh, the last you. several years. And, um, you know, hopefully part, I mean, what is the, why do you study history ever? Um, the, the answer that I was always given is you study history so you don't keep repeating the same mistakes. Mm -hmm. um, I would take that a step further in that if we've learned nothing over the last couple of years is that if we don't resolve issues in society, we keep reliving them over and over again. You know, you look at African-American history in the United States and the history of the other in, you know, most parts of the world, it's one of achievement and pushing back, achievement and pushing back. And unless we stop that cycle, it, it simply continues forever. And I'm pretty sick of it. So I, I'd like us to kind of resolve it this time. Yeah. Yes. Courtney, did you want to add anything? 
No, I mean, Miss Maxine just gave the most perfect answer. I agree with everything she said. I would only add that I hope people realize that Latham's story is representative, um, not only of stories of other African American communities that were impacted by urban renewal, but just the African American quest for citizenship, um, mainly through land ownership, but also through other means, um, just the continuous journey that African Americans have gone through in being recognized as full citizens um, is something that I hope people take away from Lakeland's story and the story of urban renewal. Okay. And we are just slightly over our time, Pat. I'm going to throw this last question from Asohe in uh, for Mr. Munoz. Um, Asohe says, I really liked hearing about the efforts that you all are making to make a, the digital archive more culturally responsive and accessible. Do these efforts include teaching any of the more tech savvy youth how to help use and maintain the archive using the tech platforms? Absolutely, thank you for that question. Um, yes, it definitely is part of our intentional way of thinking about how we are gonna not only develop the archive, but help keep it sort of healthy and strong over the years. Um, and so we've trying out, to be honest, trying out different ways of recruiting people to come and do that work with us um, and training them and giving them the skills that they need. Um, we've had great success um, with UMD students, with students from the Lakeland community and diaspora. We've been able to hire some of them through a grant um, from the state of Maryland to the city of College Park to work with us. Um, and I'll just add that, you know, we're um, ready and willing to train anybody um, no matter whether they are obviously youth or just youthful. Um, and a number of our, you know, best um, technical experts um, are youthful. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, we are past our time. I wish we could just continue going for the rest of the afternoon. Everybody write down my email address. It's glewis at bowiestate.edu because I want to talk to you some more. Um, and thank you all for attending this session and give our presenters a big round of applause, please. Thank you for coming. Okay. Thank you all so much for coming and for having us. Oh, and don't forget about the Google Slides link that Elaine just posted, which will help you get to the next session that you might be interested in going to. And please don't forget at some point, please click on the, especially if you're about to leave now, click on the um, feedback form. Do you have that, the evaluation form? Um, let's see, Elaine, can you post that again? Okay, great. It's great meeting you all. Thank you all, it's great. Yes, bye. Now we got to see your face, Ms. Violetta. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Now we can yeah. <laughs> now you're yeah. muted. Yeah, I'm gonna unmute you. There you go. Ah. I'm gonna unmute her. Oh, she froze. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, forget it. <laughs> I'm out of here. <laughs> well, thank you so much for having.